This higher language, that of tragedy, gathers closer together the dispersed moments of the individual essential world and the world of action, the substance of the divine in accordance with the nature of the notion sunders itself into its shapes and their movement is likewise in conformity with the notion. In regard to form, the language ceases to be narrative because it enters into the content just as the content ceases to be one that is imaginatively presented. The hero is himself the speaker and the performance displays to the audience who are also spec spectators self-conscious human beings who know their rights and purposes, the power and will of their specific nature, and know how to assert them. They are artists who do not express with unconscious naturalness and naivety the external aspect of their resolves and enterprises, as happens in the language accompanying ordinary actions in actual life. On the contrary, they give utterance to the inner essence. They prove the rightness of their action and the pathos which moves them is soberly asserted and definitely expressed in its universal individuality, free from the accidents of circumstance and personal idiosyncrasies. Lastly, these characters exist as actual human beings who impersonate the heroes and portray them not in the form of a narrative, but in the actual speech of the actors themselves. Just as it is essential for the statue to be the work of human hands, so is the actor essential to his mask. Not as an external condition from which artistically considered we must abstract, or so far as we do have to make abstraction from it, we admit just this, that art does not yet contain in it the true and proper self. Here in paragraph 733, we are now making a transition from one form of language to another form of language in this section on religion. And so we, we do need to keep in mind that we're not just talking about Art for art's sake, nobody created epics, tragedies, comedies, just for the sake of doing them. And they were not, you could say, a totally independent domain of human life as they were being developed. They were uh, developing not just with religious content, you know, gods doing things, heroes who are sort of like godlets, you know, little gods in some respects, sometimes often, you know, demigods, children of gods. They were part of Greek religious life, particularly tragedy, as we're going to talk about. So as we're going into this incredibly important paragraph where this transition is happening, it's probably worth spending a little time talking about what we know about Greek tragedy, the sort of things that Hegel would have had in mind and would have taken for granted in his educated readers that we might not have all of us available at hand today. We might not have learned these things. So, we're talking about two different forms of what we nowadays call literature, one of which we often place into its own category and we'd call drama or theater. And when we look at these things in an academic context, these are often like different departments, right? So for example, <clears throat> I first encountered Sophocles Oedipus the King in a <clears throat> world literature class when I was in college. I just hadn't read it up until that time. I'd heard about it and you know heard about Sophocles. I, I don't think I had actually read any so Sophocles until I was in college. And we were reading it. We were not actually seeing the play performed. And there's a, a vital difference there that we're going to get to in a moment. Aristotle is a helpful person to bring in at this point because Hegel, of course, like any educated person at the time, knows Aristotle's poetics, which is, at least in book one, about what? Tragedy. Book two, which was lost, was supposed to be about comedy. Maybe someday we'll find it, but until then, we, we don't actually know what was being said in there. And Aristotle very helpfully provides us with um, a short history 
of the development of Greek tragedy. He's not saying that it was just epic or hymns or stuff like that, and then tragedy emerged completely out of that. That's, that's not the case. The situation is more complicated than just moving from one form directly into another. But one thing that we do know about Aristotle, or from Aristotle, and uh, the history of tragedy that ties in directly with this paragraph is the nature of the actor. The, now, when we, we hear that word actor, it's related to act, right? They are depicting action, although, you know, when, when you read Greek tragedies, a lot of the action actually happens off of the uh, stage. It's not directly depicted. We hear this, oh, horror, this has occurred, right? And uh, then we, we find out it's, it's, it's more words for the actions that are coming out. But the actor, as we're going to see, is somebody who steps up on the stage behind a mask. We'll talk about the nature of masks in a bit as well. And embodies, doesn't just represent, but embodies the hero or some other character. As we're also going to see in the paragraphs to come, there's another important function, that of the chorus, which we're going to leave out for the time being. But let's mention just for the moment that um, some of the earliest dramas, according to Aristotle, had one or two actors and then a chorus. And when we say chorus, they were, in fact, not just reciting things, but singing. Right. So there's there's some other elements to it as well. There is a stage. There's some spectacle. Uh, there's some music. There's some other important things. But Aristotle isolated the most important elements as being thought, the annoia, right, expressed through what the person is saying, and then the actual plot, the account of what's going on. And this um, is going to lead us to what Hegel's talking about at the very beginning of this and what he was talking about in the previous paragraph, the necessity. How does the necessity and how does the concept, the begriff, the notion, play itself out? What function does it have? Now, as time went on, tragedy became more complex. And, you know, it's debatable about when tragedy went downhill. You know, Nietzsche thinks that it's with Euripides because it becomes too Socratic. Um, most people will generally say, well, the, the three great tragedians were uh, um, Aeschylus, you know, you might think about the Agamemnon, right, and the entire Oresteia series, uh, Sophocles, solidly in the middle, and then Euripides, and then it's, you have new tragedy with people like Agathon mentioned in the symposium, a lot of which we've lost, right? We only have little fragments of that sort of thing. And comedy was also developing at the same time. As a matter of fact, in Aristophanes, we actually have a battle between tragedians uh, that, that's laid out. Um, and there's old and new comedy. We don't have to worry about all of those ins and outs. But suffice it to say, for Hegel, all of this back history is hanging there in the background of what he's saying. So this transition from one form of language to another is playing out within that important context. And this is a context that helps us understand um, our own relation to the gods, if we're back then. Tragedies were not something that you would pick up and just read. You know, actually, I mean, reading at that time would be unrolling a scroll. It wouldn't be looking at a book like this. But it was um, something that you would, you could read it. They could be read aloud. But generally, you would see it performed. You know, we might say analogously that Listening to music is definitely not the same thing as picking up the score or the chords or the tablature and saying, oh, this looks like a really great song, right? Now, tragedy, of course, as language can convey much more in written form than, say, music can in its notation, but there's still something missing when you don't have the, let's call it the human actor element. So... I think that's probably enough to say about tragedy at this point. There is one other remark I do need to make. 
We use this word tragedy in a very loose sense these days. So somebody spills their Starbucks uh, drink and it gets on their, their you know, suit uh, before the job interview and they muff the interview as a result. Oh, that's a tragedy. No, that's not a tragedy from the Greek point of view. That is just an unfortunate experience. You know, uh, that's bad luck. <laughs> Right? That is not the same. Atuche ah, is, is actually, well, there's a word for that sort of thing, a mishap, right? It's not a tragedy. You need more to have an actual tragedy. And some of this is hinted at in the previous paragraph, right? With the middle term of the hero, the individuality of a hero who, however, in his strength and beauty, feels his life is broken and sorrowfully awaits an early death, right? That's not the only way to do tragedy, but certainly there has to be a conflict. Um, Aristotle thought that somebody mighty and high has to be brought low through some, some flaw, some hamartia, committing some wrong despite not wanting to commit wrong. And, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult to explain this. You know, you think about the Antigone. Does this neatly fit uh, the, the schema? Probably not. But it, it does give you an idea that tragedy is about important things. And it involves conflicts that exist between different values, different courses of action, um, which are legitimate and have to be taken into account with each other. This is going to come up again later in uh, the paragraphs to come. So let's talk about what's, what's going on in this section. That's a lot of preamble. Hegel says this higher language, right, Hursprache, uh, that of tragedy, so this is, this is a higher language than even the epic, which is a higher language than the hymn, the oracle, the frenzy. So we're, we're kind of ascending, right? This higher language, that of tragedy, um, gathers closer together the dispersed moments of the inner essential world and the world of action. Now that's, that's a very interesting thing to say. So let's pause on that. What is it gathering together? Um, as we, we just said here, the inner essential world. What is an inner essential world? Well, characters, whether they're gods or people, human beings, they have an interiority and they bring out that interiority through language, also through the actions that they engage in. We see them choosing X, not choosing Y. That tells you something about how they view things. But they explain themselves. They unveil their mind before us, right? And this happens in Epic too, right? Uh, at the very beginning, we have Achilles, you know, talking to his Thumo saying, should I kill this guy, Agamemnon, or shouldn't I kill this guy, right? Because uh, he's stolen my, my prize. Um, actually, the, the tale begins, you know, tell us, O oh muse, of the wrath of Achilles. The wrath being externalized is bringing this, this out of its internality, right? Uh, the inner essential world and the world of action, the world in which we do things. And this isn't just a world in which we do things. This is a world in which we do things and other people see those things and they like cooperate with it or they respond to it. We're going to punish you for doing this, this thing, right? Um, th so there's a back and forth with the world of action. Sometimes the gods get jealous of human beings for their actions. And now he says, uh, well, before we do that, so gathers closer together. This is an important phrase. This higher language, and notice that at first, this higher language, we're going to come back to that, in the epic is that of the minstrel, who is just mentioned in the previous paragraph. Who is the minstrel? Who is the, the zanger in tragedy? It's the playwright, who also doesn't just write the play out of their mind, they also have to instruct the actors and the chorus in how to do it, how it's supposed to be performed, right? Anyway, coming back to this, this higher language gathers closer together, fast, zusamen, right? Brings together, you know, gathers is, is a good, uh, idea for it, 
um, with also the sense of um, assembling, right? Assembling, putting into a kind of order. Neher brings closer together. What does it bring closer together? The dispersed moments, the moments that have been falling apart from each other and assuming their own shape. And in the epic, the epic is kind of, compared to tragedy, a you know more messy, disjointed kind of thing. You know, and Nietzsche picks up on this later on in his uh, early, as he calls it, two Hegelian work, The Birth of Tragedy. Uh, could be useful to take a look at that and how Nietzsche frames the tragedy as opposed to the epic as well. So he says, um, it gathers these together. The substance of the divine, the Gutlichen, right? The God-like, uh, sunders itself into its shapes. Tritt auseinander. Now that's an interesting way to talk about things. We'll get, we'll get to that in, in a moment. Into its shapes, its gestalten, um, its forms, its types of consciousness, we could even say, right? Now, Tritt auseinander. So the substance of the divine uh, uh, is actually sundering itself, right? It is splitting itself into things. So that we've got a gathering and a differentiation. Tritt, tritten, right? Um, it's stepping out into different forms. It is literally... Um, breaking itself into to pieces. So he goes on and he says, their movement is likewise in conformity to uh, the, the notion, right? It, it, he, the substance of the divine does this in accordance with the nature of the notion, and it's just natur uh, des begriffs, the concept. So as we saw in the previous paragraph, the necessity is no longer just a, a void. There's a, a necessity which is becoming not just intelligible in the way of like understanding, verstand. It's becoming conceptually intelligible and not just representationally intelligible. There's something going on in tragedy that has an intelligibility that we have to work to wrap our minds around. It is a complex intelligibility that is involved with the concept there. So he goes on and he says, now here's, there's a discussion here of form and content that we want to look at. In regard to form, the language ceases to be narrative because it enters into the content. So there's, there's this form work that's entering into the content. What is the content? The actions, the words, the relationships. The form is the way in which we're actually depicting things, how we're, how we're presenting things. And then in turn, he says, the content ceases to be one that is imaginatively presented. So there's an interplay going on here between form and content that is incredibly important. And well, what is this interplay? We're gonna to get to that in a moment. It has to do with what actors are doing. Right? So it's not just what the tragedian is doing, it has to do with the people that the tragedian is working with. Now, um, the form is no longer just narrative, erzählend, right? Something that is related as the minstrel or the rhapsode would be doing with epic, telling the story, right? And telling the story in a particularly poetic way, very often with some gestures and intonation and stuff like that. The content is no longer ein Vorgestalter, right? It's no longer something that is merely represented, uh, imaginatively presented is how Miller is translating it here. And that doesn't mean that this is going out the door, right? It's not like 
nobody narrates anything in a tragedy. As a matter of fact, as I just mentioned, a lot of times the action happens off screen or off stage, you could say, and somebody comes back and they're like, Ajax just fell on his sword, you know, oh, woe is me, what a terrible sight I have seen, right? Well, that's narration, right? And there is some imagination going on within this. There is a Forgestellen going on in this as well, but we're transcending that in, in some way. How are we doing that? Well, this is where we get to what's distinctive about tragedy and drama in general. He says, the hero is himself the speaker. So now it's no longer the minstrel, the bard, the zanger who's the speaker. Somebody's been put on stage to speak. The hero is not just getting lines that somebody else is saying the hero then said blah 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 the hero is speaking himself from the stage or the heroine antigone right is is also a heroine um, we have many uh, like that and he says the hero is the speaker and the performance displays to the audience very important part here the audience who are also spectators okay so we've got two different modalities being sort of referenced here. The audience, the zuhur, and this is in the singular, but it can be you know, generalized to a plurality. The audience is one who attends to, one who listens to, one who hears what is being said, but they are also spectators. They are also lookers, zuschauer, right? They are, they are seeing what is happening. You know, take a look over there, shout, right? Uh, Pay attention to what's happening. So modalities of, of listening, modalities of watching. And now notice what he says about this audience. The audience are self-conscious human beings who know their rights and purposes, the power and will of their specific nature and know how to assert them. Um, right? So the performance is displaying to the audience something about the hero and the characters that they themselves are, you know, self-conscious human beings who know their rights and purposes. You cannot, you know, let's take Creon. I am the king. You got to obey me, Antigone. Uh, I, I, I gave you an order. Don't bury your brother because he's a traitor, right? And Antigone said, well, I've, I've got a right to, I've got a right to, you know, treat my brother lovingly. But the audience are also coming into the place as people who, have, who know their rights, who are living wirklich, actual human beings, right? He goes on and he says, they are artists. Who are artists? The actors depicting the characters who do not express with unconscious naturalness and naivety, the external aspect of their resolves and enterprises, what it is that they're, they're aiming at, what they're trying to do. They don't just express the external aspect as if we are looking at them in a painting or something, or as statuary, in a mosaic would be another uh, great example, or on, on vases, right? Think about ancient vases. So he says, as happens in the language accompanying ordinary actions in actual life. When we're doing, you know, ordinary life, we're like, well, I got to go to the store and get some butter. Why you got to get the butter? Well, because, uh, you know, I'm going to make a cake and uh, we also want some butter for the popcorn. Should you get salted butter or unsalted butter? Should you get the generic uh, brand or should you get, you know, a more expensive, fancy brand, you know? Um, well, I guess it depends on how I want my cake to turn out. For the popcorn, it doesn't really matter. If it's not salted butter, I can put salt on it. This is all humdrum crap, right? <laughs> This is exactly what Hegel's talking about. And the audience comes in, and for the space of the time that they are attending to the drama, they're leaving all that crap behind. They're paying attention to something more, as Aristotle pointed out, more universal. It says, on the contrary, they, the actors, give utterance to the inner essence. They prove the rightness of their action the rightness of the action of their characters. They justify themselves. 
Even the ones who are kind of skeevy or cowards justify themselves. They're like, well, everybody's, you know, kind of a coward when you get down to it. <laughs> Again, think of the Antigone and the guard who's like, oh, man, I don't want to go to Creon and give him this bad news because people who do literally shoot the messenger. <laughs> so these are justifications that are being given. And he says, um, the pathos which moves them is soberly asserted, definitely expressed in its, now notice this term, universal individuality. What is a character? A real character, not just in drama, but we could say in literature as well, has something universal about them. At this point in time, I'm teaching a class on Ursula K. Le Guin's uh, fantasy, Earthsea, uh, novels and short stories. And when my students read about, you know, Ged, the young wizard in A Wizard of Earthsea, or about Arha or Tenar in The Tombs of Atuan, they don't think they're Ged. They don't think that they're Tenar. And this is in a very different universe than we inhabit, in which dragons exist and magic happens and has this particular ways of structuring. And there's old powers of the earth that Tenar is actually a priestess of um, since you know five years old. But we can see something in there. We can be like, well, Ged is this kind of character. That's universality, embodied in individuality. He goes on, free from accidents of circumstance and personal idiosyncrasies, like all these you know, slobs in the audience coming along and watching this. To become a really good depictor, an actor, means giving space in yourself to the character. And now look, look at the last thing he says. These characters exist as actual human beings who impersonate the heroes and portray them not in the form of a narrative as was the case in epic but in the actual speech of the actors themselves just as it's essential for the statue to be the work of human hands so is the actor essential to his mask in ancient greek comedy and tragedy and you've seen some of these masks actors would wear big masks and that allowed you to figure out who was who Right? And they would then behave in ways. So it wasn't about like facial expressions uh, or, I mean, gestures played an important role, no doubt, but especially because we had, you know, big areas in which people were doing things. You might think about what happens at concerts when, like, you know, uh, instead of just standing there and playing their guitar, you know, the person like leans into it and strums. The, those are gestures not for the front row but for the back row to display what is happening. And actors would do that, but they're wearing the mask. They have to embody through their voice, through their speaking, through how they provide, uh, you could say, a space for the hero or the anti-hero or whoever to come through. So he says, uh, the actor is essential to his mask, not as an external condition from which artistically considered we must abstract. Or so far as we do make abstraction from it, we admit this, just this, art does not yet contain in it the true and proper self. Um, the mask is less who the character is than the performance of the actor. And this takes us back to uh, an earlier paragraph, you should remember, in the very end of the living work of art, where we were talking about the dancer within the temple, right? The actor is doing this on a higher level through language and through movement and through their engagement with the other actors so that we have a genuine tragedy um, bringing together all these dispersed moments the substance of the divine representing itself within the interplay between characters and an audience who is engagedly paying attention to this and learning something about, if not themselves, certainly what's happening with the characters.